I want to introduce Dr. Kevin Ives, who many of you heard at the microphone already this morning, from John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford. Kevin. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. McQueen. I, I'm uh, just remembering it's 10 years ago that uh, is the last time I've been at this conference. And uh, I must say, I bumped into Jerry Lucy coming out of this, this, this morning's session. And I had to agree, I think this morning's session in there was, was some of the best conference talks that I've heard and the most stimulating discussion. Um, it really was, uh, as billed, a breath of fresh air. Um, I'm not promising to maintain that standard. Uh, and some of you may not regard what I say as being a breath of fresh air. Uh, I hope to convince you that uh, my use of high flow in Oxford is, is both safe uh, and judicial, um, and I may uh, win, win some favors. But also now I may possibly alienate some of you by my rather uh, uh, rumbustious style. So I've, uh, I apologize for that in advance. So let's get going. Uh, We've had eight years of experience of uh, nasal high flow therapy uh, in Oxford. Um, you all know where Oxford is. This is just to remind me how to get home uh, tomorrow. So George uh, was our first patient on high flow therapy back in November uh, 2004. Why did we pick George? As you can see, George was 100 days old. He had he had, had rescue CPAP for rather a long time, as you can see by the state of his nose. Um, we started off by using it on quite big babies to gain confidence. So there's George. We now use it as our first line uh, for all non-mechanical ventilatory respiratory support uh, in babies who are not ventilated or babies as soon as they come off a ventilator. We do not use nasal conventional CPAP anymore. In our hands, we believe it's safe. We don't see nasal trauma. Uh, we don't see an increase in air leaks. We don't see CPAP belly. Uh, you were just mentioning distension of the abdomen, but I mean really distended abdomens. We don't see that. And we've not seen an increase in infection. We think it's well tolerated and weaning is easy. Who do we use it on? So I've just said we use it on just about every baby. So you can, you can read this list for yourselves, but it, you, you're going from uh, Highland membrane disease, apnea prematurity, meconium aspiration, pneumonia, transient tachypnea, pulmonary hyperplasia, pulmonary edema, all of those. Now, I didn't bother reiterating the first two because we don't use CPAP anymore, so we don't need to use high flow to, to rescue, in my words, rescue babies from CPAP. I don't know if Brett Manley's in here. Uh, I was going to take him up on the word rescuing babies with CPAP. So, uh, I'm giving you some information or flavor of our... Uh, Babies from 2011, uh, we had uh, over 800 babies admitted, 880 old babies. We've got 18 high flow machines, and of the babies admitted to our unit, 41% of them received high flow at some stage of their admission. We've never, we don't use BiPAP, we don't use NIPPV. Those modalities have gone right over my head as I've been looking after babies with high flow. And from what I'm hearing about them, uh, I'm, I'm not so worried that I missed out on those technologies. So conventional step down from ventilation. If we do ventilate babies, we use uh, volume guarantee ventilation. But we do not follow a sequence of step downs to get to high flow. We rather cut out the middlemen. So we go straight from conventional me mechanical ventilation to nasal high flow. What I perhaps should have put on this slide was an indication that we would happily use nasal high flow for babies coming from delivery suite. They'll have brief CPAP support on delivery suite, but when they get onto my unit, which is only a matter of meters away, they're on high flow. So pictorially, this is what our unit looks like, a bit crowded, lots of high flow. Where have my nasal CPAP machines gone? They're all in a cupboard. So going back to those admissions I mentioned before, uh, 2011, we've had 877 admissions to our unit. And it's just breaking it down by birth weight groups there. But to give you an idea, these are the percentages of each of those groups 
that have received uh, high flow therapy. And I guess what strikes you is that we're also using it in, in the bigger babies. So the baby that comes around with transyntacapnea or pneumonia or milder meconium aspiration, those big babies like it. They're not fighting against uh, prongs uh, from CPAP that need to be fixed to their faces. So 41% of our admissions receive nasal high flow. A few more commercials, the nurses like it. If our babies could speak, uh, they would tell us they like it. Maybe they'll come back when they're teenagers and say how much they enjoyed the experience. <laughs> I personally think it is quieter. I, I, that's, I was very interested to hear, hear the, uh, Brett Manley's discussion of his early results using, uh, looking at the decibels that are going into the ears, but uh, pra perhaps not. Our, our parents, this mother has given me her permission to show her picture here with her little baby Esme. Uh, and as you can see, this baby's uh, on four and a half liters of flow in 25% oxygen. Quite happy to come out and cuddle her mother. Right, well, how, how do we use it? No, I don't think there's a great science to high flow. We start babies off on four to six liters, but are quite happy to go up to eight liters per minute in any gestation of baby. And I stopped thinking about pressure. I don't, it's best not to even consider it. You, if you're worried about the pressure, go and have a look at all the trials and you'll find there's nothing particularly high. You might find uh, Dominic Wilkinson's paper showing you a pressure of 12 centimeters in one setup. But to me, if people are willing to give sustained inflation breaths of 20, 25, 35 centimeters at birth for 20 seconds, or are willing to blast gases up the nose with NIPPV, I'm not worried about 12 centimeters of water pressure. And in fact, it's nowhere near that. So I turn the flow according to the baby, and the baby tells me how much flow it needs, either by its blood gases, its oxygen requirement, or what I've rather crudely put there as respiratory status. So how, a, a, a kind of visual assessment of how hard the baby's working at its breathing. Is this baby seesawing, or is the baby's respiratory rate settling? We tend to put our babies prone, reduce handling, don't let anybody go near them to take blood gases. If a baby's on high flow in up to, say, 25% oxygen, it does not need a blood gas if it's stable. Weaning, uh, as I say, most, uh, most people will, will develop their own weaning protocol. Ours is still in evolution, and some of this protocol is for, for even new for me, so I'm going to have to look at the slide itself because uh, we've had two meetings uh, last week, one in Oxford. We had an, our national meeting on high flow. I also had the privilege of going out to Milan to an Italian high flow uh, symposium at the end of last week. And we were discussing precisely this. How do you wean babies off high flow? And certainly, I think we've been guilty in the past of leaving babies on high flow for too long and not actively trying to wean them. So you may have had a chance to read this now, but I, if a baby's in at least 30% oxygen or more, you may not be able to wean the baby. If a baby's in air to 25%, I will tend in the bigger baby to wean by a litre per minute per day. Uh, if they're under a kilo, perhaps be a bit more cautious and go down by half a litre. And if the baby is in a little bit more oxygen, 26 to 30% or even more, maybe you should just be tweaking by half a litre. I've made that up, but it seems to sort of work in practice. And we then take the baby off when they're on two and a half to three litres per minute. So a little bit more information about our babies. We're an expanding unit. We have 12 intensive care cots at the moment. We're going up to 20 intensive care uh, next summer. So our very low birth weight uh, population is going to increase and has increased, as you see, in those years. What about our use? And as you can probably tell, our use of nasal high flow, which is this red line here, uh, over this period, and I can't quite see, that's 2006, I believe, we're coming up to 2011, we're up to about 80% use. I think it's probably more. These are the uh, quartiles for Vermont Oxford Network. And this is our CPAP being locked away in the cupboard. I haven't got time to go through uh, audit data that we've been looking at this group of babies from uh, 20, 2011. Um, it's incomplete at the moment in any case, but I thought I would throw this slide in just to show this is in all of our very low birth weight babies and showing you that once, if we ex extubate to nasal high flow, we don't anticipate the baby is necessarily gonna require a ventilator again. So 
nearly three quarters of babies in pink there don't go anywhere near a ventilator again. This is throughout the duration of their uh, NICU stay. And about a quarter are failing uh, and requiring reintubation. And that sort of ties in with some of the studies we've been hearing. But you must remember, these are babies all the way down to 23 weeks gestation, some of them. The early failures are sometimes the very small babies. And in our experience, the baby that fails in these ventilating has often got an infection or problems with the ductus. Pneumothoraces, up and down a bit there, but the trend is coming down. And in the last three years, these are our pneumothoraces. If you can't read the labels, the yellow line is all, all pneumothoraces, so they could be on mechanical ventilation. The lower line is pneumothoraces on high flow therapy. Now, I'm a fairly arrogant guy, and I used to go into the nursery and say, you will not see a pneumothorax on a baby on high flow therapy. So that's just bait to my juniors to come in and wave an x-ray at me. But over the last eight years, I can honestly say there's been about one baby per year who has had a pneumothorax whilst on nasal high flow. So you've got a baseline x-ray, no pneumothorax, clinical deterioration, cold light or x-ray, or perhaps we should be ultrasounding the chest now to show that pneumothorax, but it's only happened eight times. Two of those babies have got very abnormal lungs. Um, Supplemental oxygen at 28 days, and this is from 2004 upwards. Now, what's going on here? I think we've looked at this. This may be explained by the fact we were in, I was involved as coordinating part of the UK BOOST trial, uh, and certainly we were running our babies prior to BOOST at saturations of 85 to 92. Since then, we've gone 90 to 95. So I think that explains some of this uprise. Uh, Chronic lung disease again. You might think, well, what's, what's happening in Oxford the last year or so? What is happening is we're taking in a lot more smaller and sicker babies from our network. It's just been a move to uh, centralise intensive care of those babies. And I think we're, we're seeing uh, the sicker babies. So if you look at this, looking for a selection bias, um, this is what is happening. If I can operate this uh, torch, is at the top you've got the Vermont Oxford network type type B nurseries, and the gestation breakdown here, you'll see that, uh, sorry, we are between 24 and 29 weeks, proportionally, we've got more babies, more smaller and presumably sicker babies. So I think this helps to explain perhaps the, the chronic lung disease uh, blip that you're seeing on the last slide, because if you then look at it on a funnel diagram, Oxford's doing okay here, so our observed is not, is, is not appreciable, it's not as high as I expected. So that's our chronic lung disease. Okay. So, we're next in Oxford. Uh, we're hoping to have na nasal high flow on our transport system, uh, also possibly in the delivery room. Uh, home nasal high flow may be an option. Single uh, prongs we've, we've had experience of. Smart blend servo control for FiO2 from the saturation monitor, that's a development that should be coming along. I've not got time to go into these other aspects of drug delivery. But you're still thinking, I know, I, and I, I hope you don't get indigestion worrying about the pressure with high flow. You're still thinking, is this dangerous? At the age of 18, are people's lungs and hearts going to drop out of their chests? Hopefully not. When will we know the answer? Well, we've, we've We've had great fortune this morning in hearing two excellent presentations uh, of two of the randomized controlled trials. The second one in that list, Claire Collins, is someone I know who, who used to work in Oxford, and I've, I've seen the results of, of her trial. Uh, they're being accepted by Journal of Pediatrics. Um, again, similar outcomes to the two studies that we've just been heard presented this morning. So that's Claire with her chips in Melbourne. And when you add these up, I saw Bradley very kindly sent me this picture a few years ago. We were in, in email contact, and he's been very uh, genuine and uh, uh, generous in, in, in sharing his views on high flow with me. Uh, so he had the nursery picture. So we've got this one, and I haven't got a picture of Brett, unfortunately, but this is Peter Davis in the background. But you've been hearing about these trials. Those trials add up to more than 860 babies now. And at the bottom of that list there, you'll see a question mark against Elaine Boyle. We're considering a big... UK randomized control trial at the moment. 
Quality in healthcare can be measured by outcomes, safety, short-term, long-term, and satisfaction. And of course, at the end of the day, value is quality over cost. So how do we apply this to the two modalities we've been talking about this morning? Outcomes, I think, are similar. Short-term safety, certainly higher nasal trauma. I just don't see nasal trauma. I'm, I don't know where these scores of high nasal trauma with high flow are coming from. Someone said a little redness of the nose, but nothing actually touch, touches our baby's noses. Longer term, we know CPAP is relatively safe. The question mark is longer term with high flow. But when it comes down to satisfaction, be it the babies, the mothers, and particularly the nursing staff and ease of nursing, my opinion is that nasal high flow wins hand, hands down. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.